All right. A pleasant good morning to everyone. I want to welcome you to Harvard. So welcome to Harvard University and welcome to the Harvard Graduate School of Education. It is our absolute honor to have you here. My name is Peter Blair. I'm an associate professor here at Harvard in the Graduate School of Education. And this is not something that we normally do at these sorts of forums, but since we're talking about the role of faith in education, I want to say a word of blessing over this time. Father, we thank you for this auspicious moment. So many have come to witness what is about to happen from far and wide. And we thank you for Apostle Selman being here. We ask that your Holy Spirit would move through him mightily. We thank you for just opening up this space of education and learning. The proverb says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we thank you that your wisdom would be evident as he shares. We thank you, Lord, for the fireside chat with Professor Scott, that that is just a time of great anointed sharing. And for the questions that will come forth, may you bless all of those who've taken the time to be here from near and wide, those who are joining from the live stream as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome. Please have a seat. I know that many of you have traveled from far and wide, hopped on planes and trains just to be here. So thank you so much. And you waited very patiently. And the wait is, def the wait is definitely going to be worth it. We're delighted to, to bring uh, up on this event where we're going to be talking about religion and public education in contemporary Africa. And this is a topic that's incredibly important for, here, for us here at Harvard University. Because as an institution, Harvard is committed to advancing new ideas and promoting enduring knowledge. And what's more enduring than the truth of God? And also here at the Graduate School of Education, we are committed to preparing leaders and innovators who will change the world by expanding opportunity and outcomes for learners from everywhere. And that's why understanding the important role that faith plays in contemporary Africa is incredibly important because Harvard is a global institution. I'm going to give you a sense of the, the, run, of, the run of show for today. So what we're going to do first is we're going to invite uh, Apostle Selman to give a, a lecture for about 30 minutes. And then after that, there will be a fireside chat that's going to be moderated by my colleague, uh, Professor Irvin Scott. I'll introduce him before the panel. And then after that, we will have a brief time of Q&A. And I promise you, we have some delicious refreshments afterwards. But we're going to feast on the meat here in the room first, right? And, and just before um, we get started, I want to acknowledge two amazing women who are like mother, one is who's my mom and one who's like a spiritual mother to me, Professor Ruth Akadji. You want to wave for everyone? <laughs> Professor Akadji directs the Harvard Project on Biblical Law here and has been responsible for the series of, event, of events here at Harvard that has brought Apostle Selman here to our campus. And we appreciate so much the work that you've done for establishing a spiritual foundation here. And I also want to acknowledge my mom, Judith Blair, who's flown in from the Bahamas to be here. So thanks for being here, mom. <clears throat> Apostle Selwyn needs no introduction, but introduce him I must. He is the founder and senior pastor of Eternity Networks International, better known as ENI. And what's, what, what, what makes this ministry stand out is they practice the presence of God and the power of God. And we're going to see that manifested here today. He was, born, he was born in Zaria in Kunda State, Nigeria, and he was a chemical engineer before becoming a pastor, which is amazing. I, I did not know that about him. And the ministry and the work that he does as a teacher, because as someone who's a pastor, he's a teacher. The work that he does is impacting the world recently, along with another pastor. They were in the UK and about 21,000 people came and they showed up. And so we are very deeply honored to have this very intimate setting for Apostle Selman to, to speak to us. So I just want to welcome you to Harvard and welcome you to the Graduate School of Education. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted and honored to be here. And um, it's my joy to be giving my final lecture. I had one days ago, and this would be the final lecture for now. And I want to thank you so much for the honor, the invite, the love, and all that I've received within my time here. And I hope and pray that you are patient enough to let me express my thoughts. Um, 
The subject of um, education addressed at any level is very broad and very complex, uh, regardless what area you look at it from. Um, it requires very extensive study, and so to work with the time allotted, I've been able to distill a few points that reflect my thoughts on this matter. And so it's not unusual to find me omit certain thoughts. Uh, these are just my ways of trying to do justice to this subject within the time allotted. So I'm speaking on the role of faith in public education and educational policy in Africa. One more time. The role of faith in public education and educational policy in Africa. The purpose and objective, the study of faith and religion in public education, particularly in Africa, serves multiple objectives and purposes. First, it aims to foster a better understanding of the diverse religious traditions present on the continent. Africa is home to a rich tapestry of religions, including Christianity, Islam, traditional African religions, and others. By this study and lecture, students and everyone else can gain a deeper knowledge and appreciation for the beliefs, the practices, the values, and the different religious communities. Secondly, this is a contribution towards promoting religious tolerance in all its ramifications. In a continent as diverse as Africa, understanding and respecting different religious perspectives is crucial for fostering peace, harmony, and coexistence among diverse communities. By including the study of faith and religion in the curriculum, students can engage in meaningful conversations that promote mutual understanding and respect one for another. Additionally, the lecture aims to contribute to a well-rounded educational approach that addresses the spiritual and moral development of the students here present, extending the same to as many as these thoughts would reach. Understanding religious beliefs and practices can help us make sense of the world around us. It can help us cultivate moral values and develop a sense of ethics and empathy toward others. By including the study of faith and religion in our curriculum, schools can provide students with a holistic education that addresses not only academic subjects, but also their spiritual and moral growth. Furthermore, understanding faith and religion is essential for preparing students and everyone alike to navigate an increasingly interconnected and multicultural world. In a globalized society where different cultures and religions intersect, having the knowledge about the diverse religious traditions is crucial for fostering intercultural competence and promoting global citizenship. Studying faith and religion in public education can help students to develop cultural sensitivity, empathy, and appreciation for diverse perspectives, which are essential skills for thriving in a diverse and interconnected world. The historical discourse. The historical perspective of religion and faith on the educational landscape of Africa is deeply intertwined with the continent's rich history and cultural diversity. Throughout centuries, religion has played a significant role in shaping education in Africa, influencing curriculum teaching methods, and overall educational experience. Traditional African religions have long been an integral part of African societies. I think it's important we understand that uh, there are different schools of thought when it has to do 
with Africa and education. But the earliest histories will tell us that traditional African religions have always been an integral part of African societies, providing foundations for moral values, social norms, and spiritual beliefs. In many pre-colonial African societies, education has often been passed down orally through religious teachings, rituals, and ceremonies. These teachings instilled a sense of identity, community, and belonging among the individuals and contributed to the transmission of cultural knowledge from one generation to the next. With the arrival of foreign religions such as Islam and Christianity with respect to the African context now, through trade, conquest, and missionary activities, the educational landscape in Africa underwent significant transformations. Missionaries established schools and educational institutions that combined religious instructions with academic subjects, aiming to spread their faith while providing basic education to Africans. This led to the integration of religious teachings into the formal educational system, shaping the curriculum in ways and manners that reflected the values and beliefs of these foreign religions. During the colonial period, European powers brought in and sometimes imposed their educational systems on African societies, often with a focus on assimilation, cultural homogenization, and promotion of Christianity. This colonial legacy had a lasting impact on the evolution and growth of education in Africa as formal education became largely influenced by Western religions and its traditions and values. Religious schools such as the Catholic and the Protestant missions played a crucial role in providing education to Africans, but often at the expense of traditional African religions and cultural practices. In response to the colonial legacy and dominance of the West, there had been various movements to reclaim and revitalize traditional African religions and philosophies within the educational system. Efforts have been made to incorporate indigenous knowledge systems, cultural practices and values into the curriculum, thus promoting a more inclusive and culturally relevant approach to education that reflects the diversity of African societies. In recent decades, there has been a growing recognition of the importance of religious diversity and tolerance in education. Many African countries have adopted policies promoting religious pluralism, interfaith dialogue, and the respect for diverse religious beliefs within the educational system. Efforts have been made to teach about various religions in a balanced and objective manner, fostering understanding, empathy, and respect for religious diversity among all and sundry. The influence of religion on African education continues to evolve as the continent faces new challenges and opportunities in the 21st century with growing emphasis on the importance of inclusive education, cultural diversity, and global citizenship. There is a renewed focus on integrating religious studies into the curriculum in a way that promotes tolerance, again, respect, mutual understanding, first among students and then among people from diverse religious backgrounds. This historical perspective attempts to highlight the complex interplay between traditional African religion, foreign religious influences, colonial legacies, and contemporary efforts to promote diversity and tolerance in education. By understanding this historical context, educators and policymakers can work towards creating a more inclusive, 
culturally sensitive and holistic educational environment that reflects the diverse religious traditions and beliefs of the continent. The need and evolution of educational policy in Africa. In a growing and ever complex continent as Africa, factors as demographic changes, technological advances, and international cooperation have led to the entrenchment of the need for a broad-based policy-making process in Africa. Such that the dynamic multifaceted conditions and issues facing education could be addressed in a comprehensive and intelligent manner. In general, the growing concern for change and the pressures associated with that, the forces of international cooperation and the exigency to come to terms with emerging challenges of the postmodern era, they have to a greater extent shaped the policy making space of most African governments, thereby making educational policies in Africa take the form and shape that reflects needs challenges and changes of the current society. Additionally, the emerging issues and challenges due to demographic factors as well as technological discoveries and advances have also influenced the policy change exercises. For instance, the ever-increasing population and the critical democratic dispensation have led to the emergence of the concepts of open policy initiatives, which take into account the views of parents, stakeholders, professionals, politicians, and even policy implementers. On the other hand, advances in technology have opened opportunities for policymakers and implementers to explore and adopt novel and better systems that might improve educational management operations across the continent. With the emergence of globalization and advances in technology, African governments are becoming more and more aware of the need to change, manage, and upgrade their educational systems. This is because the current call for international cooperation and the current education for international competition require that Africa have a form of education that is able to meet the challenges of globalization. The attempt to reform educational policy in a manner that reflects the changes and challenges of the postmodern era seem to have been influenced by a number of interrelated factors. Among the many factors, is the public's concern and demand for change. In many African countries, especially within the 1980s and 1990s, the public became concerned with the declining standards of education and the growing form of indiscipline, inefficiency, and lack of patriotism among the citizenry. As such, there has been a pressure on autocratic regimes to transform the existing closed educational policies into liberal and progressive policies that reflect a nationalistic, democratic, and developmental desires. Educational policies in post-colonial Africa have evolved from being generally nationalistic and elitist at independence with no express state philosophy to being a more comprehensive and professional one. African leaders mainly have their priorities uh, in establishing a new educational system that will be distinct from that which was set up by colonial governments. However, the process of policy change in most African countries has not been smooth. There have been much more complex, multidimensional, and flawed changes that transform, that transformations have led to various reform initiatives in the educational sector. Now, let me pause for a moment and just make a comment about all of this, that um, 
The policies that govern education in any territory depend on many factors. Among them, the understanding of the leadership as far as the value of education, its all-inclusiveness, and the role that education plays in shaping not just the culture, but shaping the social economy of that territory. And for most part of Africa, while on one hand, they seem to frown at what they perceive to be the influence of the West in pushing in their values across the African continent, I think that um, they have not been fair enough to consider the advantages that have come by embracing Western education as to the context that they had before its arrival. So the passion to inculcate or to develop and promote indigenous African education is wonderful, positive, and I agree with it. However, I think that there is a balance, and I'll be speaking a, a bit more on that, um, so that we do not attempt to preserve indigenous um, education at the expense of the value that has come from Western education. There are many, many regions in Africa that blatantly frown at anything that reflects technological advancement and any improvement in knowledge that was beyond their original context. I think that is very dangerous, dangerous for the future of Africa. The influence of faith-based organizations on the educational landscape of Africa. You may want to listen carefully to this. Faith-based organizations play a significant role in education across Africa, often supplementing or even making leading formal educational efforts in many communities. These organizations include churches, mosques, Religious schools, non-governmental organizations with religious affiliations. Here are some of the key points about what I consider to be the role that faith-based organizations have played and should play in any society. That includes Africa. Number one, provision of educational services. Faith-based organizations often operate schools and educational programs that cater to the needs of communities where government-run schools may be inadequate or inaccessible. Now, it's difficult to understand this in a developed nation like America, but once, if you have the opportunity to study the African landscape, uh, especially rural Africa, you will find many schools, especially from the elementary level, that unfortunately um, are left at the mercy of non-governmental organizations, churches, and religious institutions because the efforts by the government and from the government to maintain these facilities and the knowledge that come there um, has been found wanting on many grounds. So you can get to a school in rural Africa where they barely have teachers. In fact, the truth is that in most cases, I'm embarrassed to say this, but it's the truth. The government does not even have a defined statistic of how many schools exist within that region. So you can find schools redundant and abandoned for many years. The government is not even aware of their existence. These schools are usually run in alignment with the religious values of the organization and often prefer a holistic approach to education that includes moral and character development alongside academic learning. Community engagement. Faith-based organizations are deeply embedded within their communities and often have a strong understanding of the local context and needs. Take note of this. It is true that the faith-based organizations within any local environment, they best understand the unique needs of the people and they are able to design a system that is holistic but then able to meet the local context of the people. This allows them to tailor educational programs to address specific challenges faced by children and families such as poverty, cultural barriers, 
lack of resources, and so on. The third role, promotion of values and ethics. Religious schools and organizations place a strong emphasis on morals and ethical values in education. They often teach virtues such as compassion, respect, and service to others alongside academic subjects. This approach resonates with many families who seek an education that aligns with their religious beliefs and cultural traditions. I had the honor to be raised by the Anglican Communion, and we had a program called the Accelerated Christian Education. Um, not many people may be familiar with that, but it was incorporated in our program and I can tell you that it played a very significant role in shaping our understanding, my understanding, as touching matters of moral, ethics, respect, and so on. So for me, this is not just a lecture. This is a reflection of a system that I am today a grateful recipient and a beneficiary of that system. Promotion of values and ethics. In fact, in many institutions of learning, they describe the condition to be um, a, true, a true ambassador of that, that institution by having knowledge and character. Knowledge and character. Not just knowledge. It is dangerous for an individual to have secular enlightenment without the requisite character. You see that it is knowledge and character that speaks to the development of society, community, and even the continent. The fourth role, teacher training and development. Some faith-based organizations invest in trainings and developing teachers, ensuring that educators are equipped with the skill and the knowledge to provide quality education to students. This can have a positive impact on the overall quality of education in communities where these organizations operate. Number five, support for vulnerable people. Faith-based organizations often prioritize serving marginalized and vulnerable populations such as orphans, children with disabilities, refugees, among others. They may provide scholarships, food assistance, and other forms of support to ensure that all children have access to education and the opportunity to thrive. Six, advocacy and policy engagement. Some faith-based organizations engage in advocacy and policy efforts to influence educational policies and practices at the national and local level. They may collaborate with government agencies, international organizations, and other stakeholders to improve educational access, educational quality, and inclusiveness for all children. The next point, promotion of interfaith dialogue and understanding. And this is a very important one. In diverse societies with multiple religious traditions, faith-based organizations can play, have played, and continue to play significant roles in promoting interfaith dialogue and understanding through educational initiatives. By bringing together students from different backgrounds, these organizations foster tolerance, respect, cooperation among the religious groups. Let me give you a final point on this. Innovation and experimentation. Some faith-based organizations are at the forefront of educational innovation, implementing new teaching methods, technologies, and curricula to enhance learning outcomes for students. By experimenting with new approaches to education, these organizations contribute to the overall improvement of the educational practice within the African continent. We clearly see that these organizations have played and continue to play a diverse, important, and impactful role 
in the education across the African soil, contributing to development of human capital, the promotion of values and ethics, the empowerment of communities, among others, by working collaboratively with governments, civil society, and other stakeholders, these organizations can help build a more inclusive, equitable, and quality educational system that benefits everyone, including children, and prepares them for a brighter future. Let me talk for a moment about faith and educational policies in Africa. I wanted to omit this point, but I decided to write it again because I think it's very important, especially within the context of our discussion. Faith plays a significant role in public education and educational policy in Africa, where religion often intersects with culture and influences the values and the beliefs of communities. In many African countries, faith-based and faith-oriented organizations, including but not limited to churches, mosques, and so on and so forth, they play a very crucial role in providing education to children and the youth. These institutions often serve as an extension of the formal educational system offering alternative options for families seeking to educate their children within the context of their faith. One of the key ways in which faith informs educational policy in Africa is through the values and the principles that underpin religious teachings. Many faith-based educational institutions prioritize moral and ethical development alongside academic learning. This is a key expression here. Emphasizing the importance of community, emphasizing the importance of compassion, emphasizing the, the importance of service to others. In fact, I recall that in many institutions across Africa, especially faith-based institutions, they would always have moments where they practice community services. They could go and clean up a community and they engage them in extracurricular activities, attempting to foster and to plant within them these religious beliefs in addition to their secular learning. These values often align with traditional African cultural beliefs reinforcing the idea of education as a means of building character and preparing individuals to contribute positively to society. In some cases, faith-based and religious organizations have also played a direct role in shaping educational policy, even at a national level. For instance, the countries where a particular religion holds significant influence be it Christianity or Islam, as the case may be. Policymakers may consult with religious leaders and institutions where developing curricula or making decisions about educational matters are concerned. That also includes funding and the development of programs. This interaction between religion and policy can sometimes lead to tensions, especially in diverse societies where different faiths coexist. At the same time, incorporating faith in education can raise important questions about inclusivity and diversity within the public school system. In Africa, for instance, where religious diversity is common, ensuring that all children have access to quality education regardless of their faith background is a key challenge for policymakers. While faith-based schools can offer valuable educational options for some families, there is a need to ensure that public schools remain inclusive and secular spaces where children from all backgrounds feel welcome and respected. Another aspect of the interaction between faith and public education in Africa is the role of religious education in the curriculum. Many African countries include religious studies as part 
of the formal educational system reflecting the importance of faith in the lives of many individuals and communities. The content and approach to teaching religious education vary widely depending on the country and the dominant religious traditions. In recent years, there have been debates about the place of religious education in public schools, with some advocating for a more inclusive and balanced approach that recognizes the diversity of religious beliefs, especially within Africa. As educational systems evolve to meet the changing needs of societies, finding a way to incorporate faith perspectives while respecting secular principles remain a very complex but important goal for policymakers. Overall, the influence of faith and religion in public education and educational policies in Africa is multifaceted, reflecting a complex interplay between religion, culture, and society. While faith-based institutions play a valuable role in providing education and promoting moral values, there is still a need for policymakers to navigate the challenges of ensuring inclusivity, diversity, and quality in the public educational system. By engaging with religious communities in a constructive and respectful manner, while upholding the principles of secularism and equality, African countries can work towards a more inclusive and effective educational system that serves all and prepares them for a diverse and interconnected world. Current challenges and debates. Incorporating religious beliefs in public education can present several challenges. Reflecting the diversity of religious beliefs and practices across the continent. Here are some of the major challenges associated with the intersection of religion and public education. In preparing my notes for this lecture, I had to take a pause to think very deeply because as I thought through these challenges, it occurred to me that they may look simple, but they are very complex. They are not a black and white solution. This, they require a lot of philosophical, intrinsic thinking, open-heartedness, and so on and so forth. But then let me run through the list that I wrote here, the current challenges that plague this intersection between religion and public education in Africa. Number one, religious diversity. Africa is home to a wide range of religious traditions, including Christianity, Islam being the major religious practices, in addition to other trado african expressions. So balancing the diverse religious beliefs of students, teachers, and communities within the public educational system can be a challenge, particularly in countries where one religion holds dominance above and perhaps against the others. You find this very, very difficult. We have, you know, different countries across the African continent where you have a dominance of one religion, and it's difficult to be able to bring some level of inclusiveness. Number two, secularism versus religious influence. This is interesting. Many African countries have secular constitutions that separate state and religion. Balancing the principle of secularism with the influence of religious groups in public education can lead to tension and conflicts over issues such as curriculum content, school practices, and the roles of religious symbols in schools, among many others. I'll stop there. Next. <laughs> Curriculum and textbook content. 
developing a curriculum that reflects the religious and cultural diversity of Africa while remaining inclusive and respectful of all beliefs can be very challenging. Ensuring that educational materials do not promote one religion over others or perpetuate stereotypes and biases is essential for fostering a harmonious learning environment. You will agree with me that this is very difficult. Very difficult. Number four, teacher training and professional development. Ensuring that teachers are equipped to navigate sensitive religious issues. One more time, sensitive religious issues in the classroom and to uphold principles of religious tolerance and diversity can be of significant challenge. Providing teachers with trainings on religious literacy, interfaith dialogue, and inclusive practices is crucial for promoting a positive learning environment. I have always been, even as one who um, helps people in matters of faith and religion, I have always frowned at extremism and fanatism. Both ways, regardless what faith practice you are affiliated with, the moment a people delve into extremism and delve into fanatism, it will usually come with a plethora of side effects. Inclusive practices. Tailoring school policies and practices to accommodate students from diverse religious backgrounds can be complex. Issues such as dress codes, dietary restrictions. Are we still here? <laughs> Observance of religious holidays, prayer spaces, and so on need to be considered to ensure that all students feel respected and included within the educational system. Freedom of religion and expression. I'm listing for you the challenges that plague this quest to interplay and to merge faith and public education. Freedom of religion and expression. Balancing the right to freedom of religion and expression with the need to maintain a neutral and inclusive public educational system can be a very delicate task. Ensuring that students are free to practice their religion while respecting the rights of others can be a challenge in environments where tension between religious groups exist. A typical example of this is in northern Nigeria. Now, with all due respect to all the faith affiliations that are here represented, um, I was born and bred in northern Nigeria, and growing up... Um, we grew up knowing the harsh reality that existed between the two main religions, Christianity and Islam. As children, we played around with one another. We celebrated Christmas. We celebrated Salah. But as we grew, we began to receive all kinds of orientations that um, um, cultured us into threading with caution as touching other religions and we watch sometimes with shock and wonder as the religious rights of many people was trampled upon, infringed, and that reality still exists even today. There are extreme practices that have violated the freedom of religious expressions of many. And it's not just typical for Nigeria, but across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we've had times where churches were burnt, Unfortunately and sadly, we've had times where extremists across boards have inflicted mayhem upon people on account of the decent practice of their faith and their beliefs. We've had people of various faith extracts victimized, even at an educational level, and so on and so forth. So um, this is a very serious one, balancing the right to freedom and the need to maintain a neutral and inclusive public educational system can be very difficult. Sometimes you find yourself teaching in an institution where the ratio of, say for instance, Christian to Muslim teachers can be, say, 8 to 2 or 4 to 1. 
at such points, it becomes very, very difficult. Difficult to be able to maintain a level of um, neutrality that allows both sides to feel protected and represented. And my apologies if in expressing any of these thoughts I hurt your religious feelings or orientation. Let me apologize in advance. The intent is to deliver an intelligent lecture that seeks to give us uh, an enlightened perspective about the role of faith and um, religion as far as the African continent and education is concerned. So I think I need to say that so that... um, We do not have people feeling hurt. I know that this is a collection of people with various faith affiliations, and I'm aware that there are many others who are following. I am an advocate of peace and love, an advocate of mutual understanding. I have my convictions as far as the matters of faith is concerned, but I owe it, and this is a principle that I've adopted as an individual, and I have reflected that principle in all that I'm involved with, to be able to show a healthy sense of respect to people's religious orientations while maintaining your convictions. Extremism and radicalization. In some regions of Africa, religious extremism and radicalization pose a threat to safety and security of schools and educational institutions. Addressing these challenges require a multifaceted approach that involves community engagements, counter-narrative initiatives, and preventive measures to safeguard students from extremist ideologies. Inequality and discrimination. Thank you for your patience so far. In some cases... Religious beliefs can be used to justify discrimination and exclusion in the educational system. Marginalized groups such as religious minorities or indigenous communities may face barriers to accessing quality education due to discrimination based on their religious beliefs. Parental and community involvement. Engaging parents and community members in discussions around the role of religion is essential for promoting transparency, accountability, and inclusivity. Building strong partnerships between schools, religious institutions, and local communities can help address challenges related to religion as far as education is concerned. Final point policy and governance. Developing clear policies and guidelines on how to address religious issues in public education is crucial for promoting harmony and respect among students, teachers, and stakeholders. Ensuring that these policies are implemented effectively and monitored for compliance is essential for fostering a tolerant and diverse educational environment. Navigating these challenges requires a balanced approach that upholds the principle of freedom, tolerance, and respect for all religious beliefs within the public educational system. By promoting dialogue, understanding, and cooperation among religious groups, policymakers, educators, and communities can work together to build a more equitable educational system that embraces the religious diversity of Africa. The intersection of faith and religion in public education, especially in Africa, presents a complex set of challenges and drawbacks that can impact the quality of the people. And this, I hope and I pray, that many people, perhaps some of you who are here, would take on projects and come up with a very intelligent approach that is pragmatic and can help to begin to provide solutions to some of these challenges. Let me give my conclusions and recommendations. My apologies for stretching your time. The matters of education is very broad, very, very broad 
and would require extensive discussions if you are to do justice to all the facets that need to be covered. In navigating the complex terrain of faith and religion in contemporary Africa, adopting a nuanced and inclusive approach is crucial to promoting equity, diversity, and social cohesion in educational systems across the continent. Here are some recommendations for addressing the challenges and drawbacks associated with the integration of faith and religion in education. Now, some of these recommendations are a personal opinion. They are not necessarily a product of thorough educational research. So if you find any of my points wanting, I do apologize. These have come as my personal recommendations. With that being said, one, Ensure inclusivity. This is my first recommendation as I tie up this lecture. The learning environment must be made such that it is inclusive of all religions and must embrace religious and non-religious perspectives by promoting diversity, respect, and dialogue among students and educators. Schools must be encouraged to celebrate the different faith traditions, cultural practices, and belief systems in a manner that is educational, respectful, non-offensive. Non-offensive. Number two, curriculum innovation. We have to develop a curriculum framework that incorporates the study of religion and its impact on societies from a non-partisan academic perspective. One more time, from a non-partisan academic perspective. The moment you politicize this, you destroy its potential to produce to capacity. We must teach about various religions in a comparative and critical manner, highlighting similarities and differences while fostering critical thinking and reflection even among students. My third recommendation. Professional development opportunities for teachers must be provided in order to enhance their understandings of religious diversity. Now, let me pause for a moment and say this. I believe in my opinion that um, the teachers, in addition to their skill, as far as their core areas of specialty is concerned, um, must be able to have, in addition to that which they know and their core area of practice, they must be open to understand religion as a diverse expression as far as human living is concerned, so that with that orientation, they are able to navigate through as they teach their students. So I take, for instance, if I'm a professor and I'm a Christian, it is wise and fair to also have a broad understanding of other faith practices. This will help you to navigate through the complexity of reaching the students without insulting or creating offense. This is what I'm trying to communicate. So professional development opportunities must be given to teachers to enhance their understanding of religious diversity, please listen, cultural sensitivity, and so on and so forth. Educators must be equipped with the skills and the knowledge to facilitate respectful and informed decisions and discussions, my apologies, about religion in the classroom while upholding the principles of neutrality and objectivity. My fourth recommendation, stakeholders, and that includes religious leaders, community members, parents, policy makers, and the civil society must be involved in productive dialogues and consultations on the role of faith and religion even in today's world. The goal is to seek 
to build a consensus around shared values, around shared goals, and approaches to addressing religious diversity as far as the educational setting is concerned. All of these stakeholders in society must be duly consulted so that their various perspectives are brought together to, to create an all-inclusive approach. Critical thinking must be promoted and emphasized. Concepts like empathy and open-mindedness without necessarily compromising on one's core religious beliefs. Now, I have interacted with all kinds of people and with different religions, religious expressions. And sometimes I've given them room to share with me their perspectives across various matters. That does not corrupt my understanding and my conviction as a Christian, for instance. But then some of them will leave rejoicing at one another's gestures because knowing, for instance, that um, I'm a man of God and then being opened, being open to listen to them. You know, sometimes perhaps maybe a flight going somewhere and I could give them the opportunity to share their perspectives. And even if I disagree, I don't have to insult them and become very harsh. I tell them, well, that's a great perspective there while keeping my own opinions true. I think that there needs to be a level of maturity that must be introduced in our being open-minded and open-hearted. It doesn't mean you have to be influenced by your, an opinion that violates your beliefs, but that it is fair enough to be open-hearted and allow people within the context of the laws that govern a land to be able to express their beliefs without offense. Now, this has been my challenge, especially with extremist views. So the moment you bring an opinion that does not seem to resonate with their belief, they can get physical, they can hurt you, they can kill you. It ought not to be so. We must sustain the maturity to be diverse in our listening and yet maintain and protect our convictions. This is a product of critical thinking as against blind loyalty to faith. There is a logic to every practice of faith. And faith that erodes your sense of reason and critical thinking has a problem. Let me repeat myself. The faith practice that erodes your sense of logic and critical thinking. You see that there is an angle and expression to faith practice that allows you to think rationally and to be able to come up with intelligent conclusions and not just to blindly follow leaders, follow policies, and follow um, expressions without an intelligent basis for it. This, I think, is one of the plagues that is troubling currently the African context of faith or religious practice. There is a blind followership without any... Um, allowance for intelligent and critical thinking. My final point, I have to stop. There's a lot more, but I have to respect your time. So I give one more point and then we'll wrap it for now. Thank you. My final suggestion as far as um, addressing these issues are concerned is to address the subject of gender equality, to integrate dis discussions on gender equality, women's rights, and empowerment into educational systems that explore the intersections of faith, religion, and gender dynamics. We must challenge harmful stereotypes and practices that perpetuate gender discrimination and violence. And we must also promote a culture of respect, equality, and inclusivity while respecting our various faith and religious beliefs. Let me stop here for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ms. Selman, for that phenomenal lecture. There was so much there. I was 
taking copious notes, and I hope that you are too. Um, we're now going to shift gears, and we're going to have a fireside chat. I want to invite my colleague, uh, Professor Irvin Scott, to come to the floor. And here at Harvard, Irvin is a senior lecturer in the Graduate School of Education, where he chairs the online master's in education program. Uh, he has a very distinguished background as a principal, as a school leader, as a teacher. Um, prior to that, he ran an initiative at the Gates Foundation that invested over $300 million in K-12 education. And moreover, he leads the leadership initiative for faith and education here at Harvard. And in April, he's going to have a book coming out that's called Leading leading with heart and soul. So please feel free to pre-order that. So he's the perfect person to engage in this fireside chat. So Irvin, thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Can we put our hands together one more time for this amazing... Just an amazing conversation. Um, like you, um, Apostle Selman, I sit at the intersection of faith and education, minister in the church, but also have been a teacher, principal, um, district leader, done a lot of work at the intersection of education and faith while simultaneously holding the faith. One of the things I want to go to right away was this question or this point that you made around fanaticism, extremism. Um, and you said it in a brilliant way. You talked about the importance of keeping one's faith, but also hearing and being able to hear, respect other individuals' faith. I think one of the things that we're struggling with, particularly in this country now, is that extremist sort of focus. Um, or the belief, and can I just say sometimes it's with Christian people in this country, the belief that if I listen to others and not project my sort of faith, um, sort of dominant perspective, then I in some ways am showing less of my faith. Can you talk a little more about that? Because you, to you, it was really important to be in a position where I can hear others, I can respect others, I can in some ways acknowledge and celebrate others, but never feel like I have to change who I am from a religious perspective. Can you say a little more about that? Thank you very much. Very powerful and, and, and intelligent question. Now, um, I, think, I think that um, what is extremism? Extremism has to do with misunderstanding um, misunderstanding your faith and the role that that faith has to play, mm. you see. And for, uh, permit my bias as a Christian, when you practice extremism in Christianity, you are trying to take the place of God in convicting the people. You see that. Jesus, who... Um, Jesus, who is the epicenter of the Christian practice, in studying his earth walk, he related with people and he was silent to listen to people as they communicated their various perspectives, uh, whether it's John 4 with the woman, the prostitute at the well, he sat with tax collectors. He was not influenced by them, but they were happy that he had an open-hearted um, they were very frank conversations. In fact, the scripture that represents the core of the Christian faith, permit me, John 3.16, came as a result of a discourse between an intelligent man and Jesus. So Nicodemus came to Jesus, the Bible tells us, and he began to probe him along the lines of, you know, why he was here and so on and so forth. And you would think that Jesus would turn and say, get out of this place. You're one of those people who offend me. Um, you're one of those nasty people. But he gave him room to express himself and they began to build a conversation. So this is my perspective. I do not believe, and, and this is my personal opinion, I do not believe you have to fight, tear down, insult, um, people to communicate your faith. I do not think in particular the Christian faith teaches that. I do not believe that. Mm -hmm. And so if a Christian in this instance practices that, I think the problem may be the system of mentorship that the person has submitted himself to. Mm -hmm. 
Because you see, permit me, prof, religion is like a gun. It depends on who is holding it. If a military man holds that gun, good for the nation. If a terrorist holds the same gun, bad for the nation. The gun itself does not destroy. The gun assumes the character of the one who holds it. This is my concept, and this would be my response to that. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I didn't expect to hear religion like a gun today, but that's powerful. <laughs> that's amazing. That's powerful. So what we've done in this country in some ways, I'll just tell about us, in light of what you were saying about Africa, is what we've said because we can't trust that people might go in that direction of fanaticism, we will have no religion talked about in the context of public schools. Talk about the risk of that. My lecture at the School of Divinity had a point of emphasis that from time immemorial, prof, all men, regardless religious affiliations, have always had a drive to connect to something, to someone. Now, my apologies if you do not believe in God. I respect your perspective. But then I will tell you that all men crave for connection. To connect to their environment, to connect sometimes with dimensions higher than themselves. This has driven us, I said in my speech, to test Try, experiment any and every available means that can help feed that appetite for connection. So I respectfully disagree with the philosophy that advocates completely taking God out of a system. This is my humble opinion and with every sense of respect and honor to the laws of your land, and your religious orientation or otherwise. This is my humble perspective. The reason is because in as much as we have all kinds of limitations around the practice of religion, that includes Christianity, Islam, um, most religions in my personal study, and believe me when I tell you I've studied a number of world religions, you see, uh, I have found out that at the core of their teachings, mm. there is a straight line that seems to unite these perspectives, albeit eventually people diverge to various thoughts. But matters of love, matters of empathy, let's use that for a case study. Mm. So if, even if it's to preserve faith practices on account of their ability to promote love, empathy, unity... I think it is worth it. Now, when a people are not governed by spiritual convictions, the laws of the land will only go so far. That is the truth. That is the truth. That is the truth. You see, so um, I, I, I do not have the professional capacity to probe into the factors that may have led to formulating some of these policies, uh, but then my humble... My humble observation, and that will also be my suggestion, is that I am a firm believer that any individual is not complete and whole outside of your touch to spirituality, outside of your touch to your creator. This is my humble observation. I want to plant the seed. It's a powerful statement there. I want to plant the seed for the work of a professor at Columbia University. Her name is Lisa Miller. And Lisa Miller is doing study on the brain, doing imaging uh, sort of study on the brain and how the brain seems to be uh, sort of designed in a, such a way that spirituality is a core part of what Absolutely. it seeks. Absolutely. Right? So she's actually trying to use scientific study to show that spirituality is actually critical in the makeup, how, makeup of how the brain is designed, which would uh, confirm what you're saying. Uh, one of the things you talked a little bit about, um, what you hinted on it, I want to go a little further into it, and it was your personal background, mm -hmm. education. Um, can you talk a little, you talked about colonialism and an indigenous, talk a little bit about how you were brought up from an education standpoint, what that experience looked like, 
maybe I always love asking this question, a favorite teacher you had that actually impacted you in a significant way so that we can dive a little more and in deeply into the person. So, well, um, my grandfather was one of the, um, the first trustees of a denomination across northern Nigeria. Mm-hmm. So I come from a lineage of missionaries. Mm-hmm. And so that gave a very great leverage, you know, born Christian home, you know, lovely place. And then um, I think that most of my educational interactions have been around mission schools and seminaries. And this has helped to shape my mindset. I give the credit to um, a there man. He's still alive. He's called Archbishop Benjamin Kwashi. And so he was a great influence in helping to build the educational community that trained us. You know, we learned values like respect, mm. morals. Um, I remember you were prohibited from taking, licking, taking candy or such and then throwing it on the ground. He would ask you to pick it up, you know, and so on and so forth. So um, those, those were the earliest memories of shaping my mind. I, I also attended um, an Air Force school. And so, but then um, having these this religious contributions, it, it helped to shape my understanding. I truly believe that part of who and what I am today is also credited to these formative years, the opportunities that, you know, came as a result of that. Um, I do not know if I would still be the Joshua Selman today if I didn't pass through some of those things. I truly believe that they represent the anchors of my conviction today. Mm. Yes. And so um, I, would, I, would, I would just say the teachers were wonderful people. We had vigils. We had prayer. We had all kinds of things. We had activities that created bonding, mutual respect. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we were taught languages and several other things. And I feel Mm -hmm. that um, when an individual has an opportunity to pass through a system that is faith-based, again, my opinion, Mm -hmm. I believe you are at a greater advantage. Mm -hmm. Truly, I believe that. The difference became clear when we looked at some of our contemporaries who did not have the privilege, some of them had to, with all due respect, delve into drugs, delve into so many things, you know, and some of them up till now, some have lost their lives, some have become inmates incarcerated in prison. And so I think that um, that foundation of moral excellence credited to faith-based um, Um, expressions in our lives have contributed immensely to who I am today. And I believe this is true for many people. Beautiful. My final question, and we'll see if we have a question or so from the audience. Um, When people ask me over the years why I do what I do as a teacher, as a principal, as a district leader, the work that I've done, one of the things that I say, and I wonder if you would say the same, Mm -hmm. is I feel like I'm called to do it. Um, How many people have used that word? I feel a calling on my life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's oftentimes, we often respond this way about secular work. So not necessarily about the preaching that I do, but about the teaching or the leading of schools. Mm. I feel a calling. Answer this question, if you would, for us. What does a calling mean to you? And how, how do you make sense of the fact that you were called to do the spiritual work while having an impact on the world in many significant ways? Very lovely question. I don't see a call as a religious statement. Um, I understand a call to mean your contribution to your world. When you discover yourself, when you discover your giftings, Mm -hmm. when you refine yourself, responding to your call is bringing honor to yourself by allowing that which is within you to be released to your world to make it a better place. So for me, your call is your contribution to making your world and your environment a better place. And it doesn't have to be from a religious, fanatical. So I consider a preacher and a lecturer, a chef and an administrator, if their motivation is to be a blessing, I consider them called. 
Now, I would say this, Prof. I would say this. Um, I was greatly mentored by the late Dr. Miles Monroe. Yes, yes. Miles Monroe. Now, Dr. Miles Monroe was an incredible person. Um, when I was beginning, you know, this work, I wrote a letter to so many people, you know, just asking their perspectives. Mm -hmm. It was Dr. Miles Monroe who replied me back, handwritten. He encouraged me and let me know that I could become anything. Beautiful. I loved him because he approached faith and nation building from an intelligent, non-fanatical, mm. non-extremist standpoint. Mm. He had the largest church then in Bahamas, and yet he was advisor to many presidents. Yes. Did you know, I hope my history is still right, that when Nelson Mandela was about to be released, mm. he and one other were the people who were delegated to go and receive him. Mm. Mm. So these are people whose impact moves from faith, but beyond the walls Absolutely. of religion. Absolutely. So with, with that backdrop, I made up my mind that I wanted to be an individual not just known for spirituality, mm. but from the springboard, the standpoint of spirituality, that I'm able to spread my influence to affect all and sundry, regardless your faith orientation, regardless your religious affiliation. I believe that I have a contribution to make to your life. And if I propose to you what is behind my convictions? And even if you reject it, it is still not enough reason to not impact you. Yeah. There is always something you can learn. By the way, Selman means the way to love. <laughs> <laughs> you will want to know that. One last thing before uh, we end on this calling point, point uh, just so it sinks in with everybody. Everyone turn and find someone. Look them dead in the eye. Turn and look at somebody. Look at someone and ask them this question. Do you know your calling? Do you <laughs> well, let's give let's give uh, Apostle Selman a round of applause, real quick. Thank you. You're amazing. Amazing. Thank you again so much, and the panelists can still remain here. This was such a phenomenal event, um, Apostle Selman. I hope this is not the last time that you'll be coming to Harvard. Can we get that on record? Will you be coming back again? I hope. I pray. <laughs> I think. So it's, it's on record that he'll be coming back, okay? Because we, we did not have nearly enough time with you here at the Graduate School of Education. I think that other parts of the university would want to engage with you. And the note that he ended on with, too, I just want to... That blesses me so much. So Dr. Miles Monroe was my pastor in the Bahamas and my mom's pastor. And so... As a kid, every Saturday, I would sell fruits with my mom to him and his wife, Ruth, and... Every, he wrote my letter of recommendation for college to come to the United States. And, you know, to think about the impact that he's had on your life and now you're coming back here. And, and it's so powerful because when we think about the mission of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, it's about preparing leaders and innovators in education to provide opportunities for learners from all around the world. And that story is so interconnected, right? It's connecting the Bahamas with Nigeria, with the United States of America too. And so this is, this is such an incredible, incredible moment. I want, before we leave, we have a gift to give you on behalf of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I want to invite a couple of folks here to be um, a part of this presentation. Uh, Ruth Okadaji is one of our faculty members. I'm Delia Umano my mom from the Bahamas, and then Marty West. Please come up, Marty, our academic dean. Yeah, please, please, please come down. And feel free to take pictures, too. Um, we, we believe that the, in, the, in the scriptures it says your gift will make room for you, and whenever you come into the presence of someone with greatness, you want to come bearing gifts. Um, when, the, when folks came to Jesus' birth, they came bearing gifts, and so we have, we have awesome swag here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. <laughs> so there's, there's a mall skin in here so that you can write your notes on this Harvard ledger. There's a nice water bottle, you know, so that there's living water coming out of you. So we're going to put some, <laughs> some actual water on you. And then we, 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 got a, we got a bag in here, too. So this is, this is for your blessing. So when people come and give into your bag, there's something that they can receive, too. So, again, thank you so much for coming to Harvard.
I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say something. Uh, you're, Peter, you're a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Apostle Selman, it's a delight to have you here. What Peter said about our mission really captures what it is we're trying to do at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and would welcome any opportunity to partner with you uh, going forward. So thank you. And, and Ruth, you're not going to escape. This is, this is my spiritual moment here. Come here. Mm-mm. You're not going to escape. You've got to say a little something. Um, thank you all for being here. I want to thank um, Marty, who is just, um, we don't see each other enough but we know we're here and I know that um, he thinks and prays about this institution and about other colleagues and certainly about the School of Education. And I said to both um, Dr. Scott and and, uh, Professor Blair that for those of you who are Harvard students and Harvard faculty, you rarely see the School of Education in the Crimson or the Gazette or in the New York Times, but when we think of what knowledge does to open the way for faith, for the improvement of humanity, for contributions to society. This is the crown jewel of Harvard University. And I'm so grateful for Marty's leadership, for all of you, for the work that is happening here, because education not only opens doors, but it is a leveler. It's the thing that people will look at and say, God has given you a gift you can go out and be whoever you want to be. Every teacher has been such a blessing in my life. My parents were teachers, and so I'm incredible, incredibly grateful to the Harvard School of Graduate Education. Thank you. All right. And just one other thing. I'm known for my selfies. I need to get you folks into a selfie. So please come here. And then after that, we have a very delicious... Um, selfies, would you permit me so he can do this? Oh, sure. Okay, sure. Yeah. And we have a very, we have a very delicious spread um, outside of, of wonderful refreshments. Come on, you guys, take a picture so people can eat. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy the food outside as you exit. It's going to be on your left here. We have a really nice spread. And if you've come in from out of town to Harvard, please um, traverse the campus and see all that we have to offer here. Welcome. Welcome.